a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ is mediator of a new covenant, since a death has taken place, for deliverance from transgressions under the first covenant. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. Not that he might offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice, just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment. So also Christ offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. Verbum Domini. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous deeds. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him, his holy arm. Sing, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous deeds. The Lord has made his salvation known. In the sight of the nations, he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness and his faithfulness towards the house of Israel. Sing, sing to the Lord. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. Sing, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has Sing praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Sing joyfully before the King, the Lord. Dominus Fabiscum, et cum Spiritu Tuo, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, Gloria Tibi et The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said of Jesus, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. 
How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie October Baby. It was released in 2011, and much of it was filmed here in Birmingham, Alabama. In fact, there's a, a scene in the cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral here in Birmingham. And it relates really a reality today that there are a number of people alive today who survived their mother's abortions. And the, the writers of this film had in a particular way in mind Gianna Jensen. You know, this past Saturday, we had the Walk for Life West Coast in San Francisco, and one of the people who gave a talk was Melissa Oden, whose own mother at 19 had a sailing abortion of her, but she survived, and she was adopted into a loving family. And she and her mother, uh, reckon, or she went to, she was wanting to search out her birth mother, which she did, and there was a forgiveness that came about through that. There was a healing that came through that. But the uh, woman who played the mother of the young woman who didn't know why she was having all of these different problems, emotional and physical problems in her life, then she comes to learn the truth that her own mother had tried to abort her. And she goes in search of this mother and she finds her. And one of the most moving scenes in that film is when the mother, Cindy, finds on her desk a note from her daughter and it said the simple words, I forgive you. And Cindy in the movie closes the door and she slides down to the floor and she just begins weeping. And later this actress, her name is Sharon Rigby, related what had happened, that she was given the script. And when she saw at first the, the young woman who was going to play her daughter, she said, she looks just like me. She could have been my daughter that I aborted. She'd be about the same age as a daughter that I had aborted. And when that moment happened, she said there was something more going on than acting. And she actually, although it's not on the film for 15 minutes, for 15 minutes she just wept. She just wept, wept, and she said that she felt the embrace of Christ. She felt that she was forgiven, that she was restored. Those are words that she, she said, that she, there was a restoration that happened to her in that moment, in that 15 minutes of tearful dealing with the reality of her own sinful past but also finding that restoration, that healing in Christ. And as we today and throughout the United States, all of the dioceses of the United States have a day of prayer for the legal protection of unborn children. Typically it's on January 22nd, unless it's on a Sunday as it was this year, then it is on the 23rd today. There's one of two masses that can be offered and we're offering this mass for the full restoration of the legal guarantee of the right to life for all people, especially the unborn. 
and of penance for violations against the dignity of the human person committed through the acts of abortion. So one of two masses can be offered. One, for giving thanks to God for the gift of human life in which you wear white vestments. That's the mass that I chose because I especially thought the prayers are very poignant for today. How the collect today spoke of how God alone has a power to impart the breath of life, forming us in our mother's wombs, and help us to remain faithful to the sacred trust that you've given to us to safeguard the dignity of every human life. The other one that could be offered is for the preservation of peace and justice wearing violet vestments. So we chose the first one, and I especially wanted to use this vestment with a popular image of Our Lady and the child Jesus as a reminder, of course, of the beauty of motherhood, the dignity of motherhood. But also I begin with that story because it relates how God wants to reconcile so many women that have experienced pressure. In fact, Melissa Oden on Saturday, this, this young woman who survived her mother's abortion, she said that her own mother had been pressured into this. And often abortion is not a choice, it's the unchoice. Women feel pressured because it is so available, either by boyfriends or parents or others. They feel pressured into this choice. It's often an an unchoice. And I also wanted to comment in a particular way on two passages from today's scripture readings. The one reading is from today's gospel. In fact, this is in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus speaks about this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a sin that can never be forgiven. And people talk, have talked to me during my priesthood about how they worried about whether they had committed that sin that can never be forgiven. Often women too struggle with being able to receive the forgiveness of the Lord for the sin of abortion. But what is this sin that can never be forgiven? Pope St. John Paul II talks about this in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit. And this is uh, number 46 in the encyclical on the Holy Spirit. He's talking specifically about this. Here's what he says. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, then, is the sin committed by the person who claims to have a right to persist in evil in any sin at all and who thus rejects redemption. One closes oneself up in sin, thus making impossible one's conversion and consequently the remission of sins, which one considers not essential or not important for one's life. This is a state of spiritual ruin. He calls it a self-imposed imprisonment that you're no longer able op to open yourself to the purification of your conscience, the remission of your sin. Why? Because you are persistent in your right to persist in evil. And you persist in that until your death. You see, the Holy Spirit continues to prompt us through our life, calling us to conversion. Our conscience prompts us to return to the Lord if we've sinned against the Lord. But he doesn't force himself. It's an invitation to return. It's an invitation to conversion. And anyone who has sincerely repented, like Sharon experienced at this moment, where she confronted you know, this reality of her past, but she accepted the forgiveness of Christ. Any sin can be forgiven if there is repentance. The Holy Father says non-forgiveness is linked as to its cause, non-repentance. So if there is repentance, that there is forgiveness that is found. But if there is this persistence in evil, and we can talk to prominent Catholic politicians who persist in evil and promulgating evil, you're endangering 
your eternal salvation. And what did the letter to the Hebrews say today? That Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. He appeared before God on our behalf. That he, by his sacrifice, he's taken away sin once and for all. But this letter also said that it is appointed for human beings to die once and after this, the judgment. We have one life to live. We will die once and then we will be judged on how we have lived our life. And so it's very important that we live our life in a way that is, uh, that is appropriate for heaven, that, that is the life of heaven, that is a life that loves life, nurtures life. As many of you know, of course, there was the Women's March on Washington yesterday, which is very much a pro-abortion movement. And I had this story that I'd kept some time ago on Dorothy Day. Now, Dorothy Day, the Archdiocese of New York, has introduced her cause for canonization. She was a convert to the faith, Catholic faith, in 1927. Prior to that, she was living somewhat of a wild life. She herself had had an abortion. She was a social activist. She worked for the right for women to vote. And she continued after her conversion to Catholicism, the baptism of her daughter, to work for Catholic, Catholic social teaching. Well, a woman wrote this article, and her name is Alice Lang from South Dakota. And her husband was involved in the college there in South Dakota. And he was in charge of visiting scholars. And so he had invited Dorothy Day, this was 1971, he invited Dorothy Day to come and talk at the college. Well, there was going to be a meeting on the rights for women at this college. And so they invited Dorothy Day, since she was in South Dakota, to come and speak. Now, Dorothy stayed at the family, the Lang family. They had four children under the age of eight. It's a very uh, active children, uh, Alice says. And so they were getting ready to go to this women's right talk at the college there. And so Dorothy is waiting in the rocking chair while she's calling for a babysitter. She's preparing meals for her children. She feeds her baby. She gives instructions to the babysitter. All this is going on, the usual things when the mother's going to be leaving the home for a little while. And then she drives Dorothy over to this talk. The young women, she said, sponsoring this event were thrilled that Dorothy was going to be talking to them. And Here's what she wrote. She said the young women, the young woman in charge of the meeting welcomed the audience and gave a short background on Dorothy Day in preparation for Dorothy's presentation. She announced that Miss Day understood a woman's right to choose and that abortion was very much at the heart of empowering women. Dorothy, who was sitting in the front row, rose out of her chair to her full angular forbidding height, shook her finger at the speaker, and angrily scolded her on the falseness of such a belief, on the dignity of women and the children, child's right to life. Because of the amazement of the moment, I do not recall, Alice wrote, her exact words, but I remember she told these young women in great detail how I, Alice, had worked and sacrificed to take care of the children so I could come to the meeting. Her point was that this had dignity and was life-giving. After her lecture, there was nothing more to say. The young women hung their heads and were silent. We picked up our handbags and left. On the drive home, Dorothy was still indignant about the indignity of the gathering. Nurturing life, she felt, should be the priority for all adults, and sacrifices needed to be made for the next generation. That's the beauty, isn't it, of nurturing life, 
of supporting life, of making sacrifices for the next generation, not robbing the next generation of life for me, but laying down my life for the good of the next generation. Jesus taught us that. And that's something that is made present at every Mass, a representation of his sacrifice, of his offering for us. As a letter to the Hebrews said, he is the mediator of a new covenant and that he has appeared not in an earthly sanctuary, but now in heaven itself to appear before God on our behalf. Now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. He offered once to take away the sins of many. That's our salvation. That's what Sherry Rigby experienced in that filming of October Baby. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to, to watch. It's a beautiful film. But what she experienced is what God wants for all of us. We've, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of what we are called to be. And yet we can know the salvation of Jesus. We can know the embrace of Christ. We can know his forgiveness. And there's no sin that cannot be forgiven if we repent of it, if we return to the Lord, and we strive to live a life differently.